Hi everyone, this is Dr. Young. Uh, course is Western Civilization I um, at Flagler College. Our topic for today is uh, early Greece, um, and uh, this will be the first of four um, videos that I'm going to post on the, the history of ancient Greece. Uh, this one will cover the periods known as the, the uh, Minoan and Mycenaean periods, as well as the so-called Greek Dark Age and the Archaic Age, um, and so we're going to cover more than a thousand years of history in this one. Um, in a subsequent uh, uh, lecture, I will um, cover the, the classical period of Greece, roughly the beginning of the 5th century BCE through the 4th century BCE. Um, I will also have uh, a video devoted to um, the reading of primary sources uh, from ancient Greece, um, including the longer assigned text, uh, Euripides' play The Trojan Women, um, and so I'll, I'll uh, have a, an online discussion about that. And then finally, uh, I will, there will be another video devoted to the Hellenistic period, uh, that is the period created by the conquests of Alexander the Great that stretches from the, the late 4th century through uh, about the 1st century BCE. Um, so uh, the Greeks are, uh, of all of the peoples in Western civilization, arguably the most important in terms of their contributions that they have made. It has been said by historians that um, Western civilization is pretty much Greek, uh, apart from the Hebrew religion, uh, which has been adopted by most of Western civilization over the last couple of thousand years. Um, to be more specific, I, I think it's fair to say that we inhabit Greek buildings, um, the history of Western architecture really begins with the Greeks and, and everything else is just a variation on that theme. Um, and we, uh, maybe even more importantly, we think Greek thoughts. The uh, intellectual traditions of the West uh, stem from the ancient Greeks, particularly the philosophers Plato and Aristotle, um, though you know a lot of uh, Western historical thinking really begins with the Greeks, with the historians Herodotus and Thucydides. Uh, also, the, the great dramatic works of ancient Athens, uh, the great tragedians, uh, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, as well as the, um, uh, the comedies of Aristophanes, uh, form a lot of the, uh, the, the primary source base for the Western intellectual tradition. Um, and, you know, that's to say nothing of Greek art and, and things like that. So the Greeks are tremendously influential. Um, Western civilization starts properly with the Greeks, although we have talked about uh, the uh, civilizations of the ancient Near East. And, and it should be acknowledged that the Greeks do owe a debt to those earlier civilizations. They borrowed a great deal from them. Um, but they also came up with um, an astounding number of their own contributions. Like we talked about when we discussed Mesopotamia and Egypt, the uh, geography of Greece is important. Um, Sorry, I messed up there. Uh, if we look at the uh, uh, some shots of the topography, and these are rather spectacular, uh, but you can see that Greece is very mountainous. Um, here's another one. This is Mount Olympus. Uh, so Greece is very mountainous, and, and in fact, uh, in many places, these Greek islands and peninsulas come straight up out of the uh, Mediterranean or the Aegean Sea. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are some pretty spectacular cliffs there. Uh, and within a few miles, you can get as high as about 10,000 feet above sea level. Um, there is no place in Greece that is further than 40 or 50 miles from the sea. Um, and there really is no place that is not covered with mountains. Uh, these, are, these are volcanic islands and peninsulas that were you know, formed by um, uh, earlier geologic ages of the Earth's history, where there's a lot of volcanic activity. Um, and, and it's pretty spectacular to witness this. Uh, what that means is that getting across Greece is difficult. Um, transportation is, uh, is not easy to go over mountains. Um, and moreover, only about 20% of all of the land of Greece is arable. That means that it's difficult to farm. Uh, and, you know, in ancient Greece, of course, people relied heavily on whatever the land uh, produced from them or for them. Um, and, and so uh, having farmland was tremendously important, but there was uh, not a lot of farmland to go around, 
which meant that the Greeks were constantly in conflict with one another, and that conflict is an important source of, um, you know, culture and uh, and social organization and things like this. We have to acknowledge that Greece was was always riven by conflicts between individual settlements. But topography also um, made it uh, difficult for Greeks to feel connected with each other um, because they were cut off from each other by imposing geographic boundaries. Um, they and, and so you know Greeks, their primary identity was uh, tied to their own local situation um, and the settlements that formed in the you know the various valleys uh, between these mountains. Uh, became very tight knit. Uh, the people were reliant on each other, and uh, they they thought very much in terms of their local circumstances. They developed rivalries with people who lived uh, on the other side of the mountain, say, um, and those rivalries would be a, a very important you know source again of uh, the, the formation of the Greek civilization. That said, they did have an overarching sense of what we might call sorry for the on there, uh, what we might call Greekness. They shared a language and to some extent shared a culture, although there were uh, a, a, an astounding number of local variations on that. So we'll talk about uh, these paradoxes of Greek life, the, the localism versus the universal or the, the Panhellenic um, uh, as we go on here a bit. But, you know, we need to start with, uh, with an understanding of the geography here, um, that this is imposing, it's difficult to get around, people had to travel by sea far more than they traveled by land, they were reliant on the sea um, uh, tremendously, and uh, they developed these very localized identities. Now, the earliest layer of Greek history, where we can begin to detect civilization in the Greek world, uh, is called the Minoan period. Uh, Minoans named after the legendary King Minos. Uh, these, uh, the, the people who lived during this time didn't necessarily call themselves Minoans, but uh, the legends about King Minos tie uh, that name to these people. And so in the 19th century, when uh, European scholars and, and uh, antiquarians began to study the Greeks, they, uh, they chose that name for this earliest layer of people. Um, and so this dates from around the beginning of the second millennium BCE, uh, and it's the, the Minoans inhabited not Greece proper, not the Peloponnesus, but rather the island of Crete, which is some 75 miles or so out into the Mediterranean. Um, these people, it seems, spoke a language that eventually evolved into uh, ancient Greek. It was a, probably a different language that early on. Um, it may have been one of a number of dialects that, that came together. Um, the Minoans left behind some interesting and rather enigmatic evidence. Now, specifically, the island of Crete had these settlements uh, from about 2000 BCE on called, the, the scholar, modern scholars have called palace complexes. Called so because there was a central set of buildings that seem to have formed a, a kind of palace, that is a political capital, uh, for the ruler uh, of the region. And uh, uh, these palace complexes also seem to have been economic centers. Interestingly, they did not have defensive walls, which indicates that the people living in these palace complexes did not feel threatened, that they were isolated enough that they didn't fear invasion from outside, um, and they seem to have lived in, in relative uh, peace and prosperity. The most important of these palace complexes was called Knossos, and these images that you see here are from Knossos. Uh, unfortunately for the historical record, the one who excavated Knossos was an English adventurer named Arthur Evans, not really a trained historian or archaeologist necessarily. This was in the 19th century, and those professional disciplines were still developing, but he was a, a kind of wealthy, eccentric uh, antiquarian. He was very interested in Greek history and went to Crete and began to dig at this site of... Um, and I apologize for all the yawns today. I guess I haven't been getting enough sleep lately, so hopefully that's not going to be a terrible distraction. 
Uh, but he began to dig into Knossos, and he uncovered evidence of these wonderful frescoes uh, that, that, that date back to um, this early Minoan period. And Arthur Evans' uh, scholarly standards not yet being established, standards of historic preservation not yet uh, really formed, um, decided that he was going to touch up the paintings. He, he fancied himself a, a skilled painter, and so he took out his paints and he completed many of these paintings, or rather he painted over the parts that were damaged uh, to try to recapture the original, uh, the original intent uh, of those paintings. Um, and so we have to sort of look through the, the 19th century layer of Arthur Evans and try to see below that uh, for the original, um, uh, the original aesthetic here. And what becomes obvious, if you look at the image on the right there, um, is that the people of Crete were influenced by Egypt. Um, this figure is very rigid. Uh, the pose is, is highly Egyptian. Everything from uh, the way the feet are placed to the, uh, the profile of the person, uh, you know, uh, the upper body of the person. Uh, to the very, very small waist. Uh, all of those things are features of Egyptian art. So why, why did the people of Crete have contact with Egypt? Well, the only answer there is trade, right? Um, uh, Crete seems to have been a kind of uh, middle uh, location for goods coming out of the Eastern Mediterranean, being shipped down to Egypt and Mesopotamia, and through that contact, the people of Crete um, uh, developed uh, artistic sensibilities that were influenced by the Egyptians. However, they did take these in directions that were new and unique to them. Um, the headdress, for instance, is different from what you would find in Egypt. Uh, there are a number of other features of, of the art here um, that is, is different. One very interesting image, and maybe the most famous image from Knossos, is this one. Um, the real question is, what is going on in this painting? It looks like somebody is grabbing on to the, the horns of a charging bull, vaulting over the back of the bull, uh, and doing some sort of acrobatic uh, routine, and landing on the right side of the, uh, the image there um, you know, in a pose that is indicative of um, an Olympic gymnast. Uh, you know, was this really what happened? Well, that's uh, a debatable point. This may have been um, uh, someone's fantasy, but uh, there are a number of frescoes that depict this bull leaping scene uh, in Knossos, and so this may have been some kind of ritual that, that the people uh, enacted there. The problem with Knossos and with the whole Minoan period is that we don't have written evidence that we can decipher. Um, there are written documents that were produced at Knossos this early on, um, but they're written in a script that is indecipherable. There aren't enough examples of that script to give scholars a critical mass uh, that they can use to interpret it um, and, and figure out what, it, what they're actually saying. And so we're in the dark to some extent on um, figuring out what, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what the people of Knossos were all about. Um, what seems to have been the case from further excavations is that Knossos uh, on the northern side of the island of Crete was the dominant palace complex and that it ruled over as a kind of alpha uh, uh, um, dominant uh, settlement over the other settlements on the island. Now Knossos did have contact with the Greek mainland. In fact this becomes obvious as we start to look at the evidence uh, emerging around the middle of the second millennium BCE on the Peloponnesus. So 75 miles to the north on the Greek mainland, uh, we see the emergence of palace complexes there. These are slightly different, although their, their layout is similar. Um, they did have defensive walls, which indicates that there was a great deal more conflict going on there. Um, in fact, that conflict eventually extended to Crete uh, and Knossos, which was unprepared to receive it um, because the, uh, the, the people from the Greek mainland, after a couple of centuries of, of uh, taking their cues from Knossos, decided to go and conquer Knossos. Um, and for the last couple of centuries of, the, uh, of this period, um, Knossos was ruled by one of the palace complexes on the Greek mainland. Uh, this period uh, that sees the emergence of uh, these palace complexes in Greece 
is called the Mycenaean period. So here you get, uh, here's Canossos down here on Crete, um, and then all of these uh, labeled settlements here were the important palace complexes of the Mycenaean period, stretching from about uh, 16, 1700 BCE um, in their earliest phase to about 1200 BCE when they're all destroyed. Um, the, the most important of these probably was Mycenae, which is here, uh, though settlements like Athens and Thebes, which would later be very important uh, Greek uh, city-states, had already emerged in this Mycenaean period, in this Mycenaean period as important palace complexes. Um, but the, uh, the whole period gets its name from Mycenae, uh, which is also a very rich archaeological site um, and uh, has given us a lot of good information about what was going on in this period. Um, there does seem to have been a great deal of conflict, but also trade. Uh, between the palace complexes. And uh, there is a script here called Linear B, um, which scholars have deciphered um, to some extent, but again, there are not enough uh, uh, documents that, that you know give us a full sense of this um, civilization that emerged on Greece. Uh, the thing that is obvious is that uh, around 1200 BCE, and we discussed this earlier in talking about the ancient Near East, there was a massive cataclysm uh, the invasion of the Sea Peoples again, um, that destroyed all of these palace complexes. And this seems to have been rather sudden. Two pieces of evidence indicate that. First of all, the Linear B texts uh, that exist do not have a sense of impending doom. They don't, they don't talk about uh, uh, you know, invading armies or anything like that. It seems to have been business as usual, and then in a very short period of time, everything was into chaos and, and destruction. Uh, the other one is that uh, in the archaeological layers of these civilizations, um, there is a burn layer that dates from around 1200 BCE, and some of these cities, uh, some of these palace complexes, were never constructed again um, after, that, uh, after they were destroyed. And so there seems to have been widespread destruction around that time, so much that Greece was thrown into uh, complete political chaos um, and ended up uh, quite culturally stagnant. Now, this, this is a, a, a sharp break in the record uh, of ancient Greek history. For about 300 years, we have no written documents. From about the 12th century BCE through about the uh, the, the early or the late 9th, early 8th century BCE, there are no written documents. Writing seems to have passed out of knowledge, in fact, because the the writing system that emerges after this period is different from the one that existed before it, um, which seems to indicate that they got rid of the old system or that it passed completely out of usage and they invented a wholly new writing system uh, once things had settled down. The other thing that happened was um, that the political hegemony that the uh, palace complexes had enjoyed, uh, you know, Athens had enjoyed rule over, the, over a fairly large area in this period, Pylos over much of the southern Peloponnesus by the way, I keep using this uh, this name. You should know uh, this if you know anything about if you want to know anything about Greek geography. That this peninsula down here that looks like a deformed claw uh, is called the Peloponnesus. It's divided from um, the other regions of Greece up here by this gulf called the Gulf of Corinth, called so because the city of Corinth is about right here. Um, uh, this is called the Saronic Gulf. Um, and so, uh, and you know, the, my, the uh, Peloponnesus is joined to the rest of Greece by this small peninsula here, or rather this isthmus, it's not a peninsula, isthmus, uh, called the Isthmus of Corinth. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the Peloponnesus is cut off almost entirely except for this small isthmus from the rest of the Greek mainland. Um, so Pylos, back to our discussion here, Pylos had ruled over the, the whole southern part of the um, Peloponnesus, uh, in the Mycenaean period, and Mycenae had ruled over much of the northern part of the the Peloponnesus, and so these uh, um, these palace complexes had a fairly broad hegemony. Well, all of that was dealt a death blow with the invasions of the Sea Peoples, and politics devolved very much to the local level. Local strongmen 
uh, people who could protect other others, uh, emerged as the political leaders. And the name for these uh, emerging leaders was uh, the Greek term Basileus. Um, and that's in the Greek text that's usually translated as king. Uh, it probably would be better translated as, as chieftain or something like that. But during the Dark Age, the, uh, the settlements that, that survived um, uh, were, were ruled, for the most part, it seems, by these Basileis um, or these chieftains. Now, that period, the Greek Dark Age, it's called, uh, lasted again for about 300 years. That doesn't mean that the Greeks were entirely stagnant. Stagnant. We can uh, detect from the archaeological record that uh, they were probably involved in trade with each other, uh, and that over time, as things stabilized, they uh, had more leisure time. Um, the pottery, for instance, is very plain in the early part of the Dark Age period. Uh, but later on, it you know they developed geometric patterns and and more elaboration in terms of decoration and things like that, which indicates that uh, you know people had time on their hands that they um, used to to create decorative pottery and things like this. Right? Um, they were not always uh, worried for their own safety, um, and and so things do seem to have stabilized uh, over time. There are. Uh, some interesting archaeological excavations that, that give us a sense of, you know, at least some of the things that were happening during this period. Now, uh, in the 8th century, Greece suddenly emerges, and I mean emerges into the historical record, with some flair. Uh, uh, the sources for this are um, very, two very important authors, uh, Homer, uh, famous for writing the Iliad and the Odyssey, and uh, uh, the, another Greek author named Hesiod, uh, who wrote two very important works, one called um, uh, the Theogony and the other one called Works and Days, uh, which give us a very full picture of life in the 8th century. It's kind of remarkable that after three centuries of no writing, that the first texts that are written down by the Greeks uh, or at least the, the earliest ones that we have extant in the Greek historical record, are these wonderful pieces of literature that, uh, you know, have uh, a rightful place among the greatest works of literature ever composed by uh, people in the Western tradition, or in any tradition for that matter. Um, well, what does that indicate? Uh, Homer, if there was a single individual named Homer, was almost certainly not responsible for the invention of those stories. These are uh, the stories that uh, take shape in these mythological works, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and in Hesiod's works as well, seem to have been stories that were told for some time, perhaps through the entirety of the Dark Age, uh, and they even um, preserve to some extent the memory of things that existed before the Dark Age. Um, the uh, the, the kinds of uh, political and, and social structures that it, that uh, existed in the Mycenaean age. Uh, in fact, we can find that evidence, the surviving evidence from Myc the Mycenaean period, uh, very much alongside um, information that uh, is indicative of the, the world that Homer himself inhabited. Again, if there was a single individual named Homer, he may just be a figure of legend. Uh, a very interesting piece of evidence here is uh, the, the term Basileus. Uh, if you know the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, these are both uh, epic legends about uh, the, war, the Greek and Trojan warriors who fought during the Trojan War. Um, and the Greek army um, is made up of figures, all of whom go by the title Basileus. Uh, and so Odysseus, and uh, Menelaus, and Ajax, and Patroclus, and Achilles, uh, all of these famous Greek warriors, all have the title Basileus, which indicates that they were the military chieftains over individual Greek settlements, right? Uh, that is, they all have that title except for one. The, the, the overall leader of the Greek army, um, and also the ruler of the city of Mycenae, uh, Menelaus' brother Agamemnon does not go by the title Basileus, rather he goes by the title Wanox. And it turns out this is an antiquated term. 
this is a term that we find in the linear B text from the Mycenaean period, uh, a term for the person who ruled over a palace complex. Now, were there still Wanakes, that's the plural of Wanaks, in the 8th century when Homer was writing things down? No, almost certainly not. Um, rather, this was something preserved over the centuries, the memory of uh, a political system that had passed out of existence but was known, you know, in the, the kind of legends that they, the people told each other in Greece. Um, and so that, that memory was preserved even as things changed dramatically. Now, the period uh, kicked off by the, uh, um, well, for the indicated, you know, by these uh, wonderful primary sources. And I'll return, by the way, in, in a later uh, video um, to a, a further discussion of Homer, because there are a few other things that we should say about him. And in fact, you, uh, the students for this class, are assigned to read uh, book one of the Odyssey, and there's some interesting information there that we need to talk about. So we're not done with Homer yet. Um, but there's a lot of uh, other things that we should discuss uh, about the, uh, the period after the Greek Dark Age. This is known as the Archaic Age, and it extends from uh, about 800 to about 500 BCE. And it really is the formative period of ancient Greek history. Um, it's, it's the period when the structures that come to define Greece socially, culturally, politically, economically, all were put into place. Uh, now, I'm not going to, you know, do a, an exhaustive uh, kind of coverage of everything that happened during the Archaic Age, but I do want to pick up a few themes. First of all, as this map indicates, the Greeks spread out during the Archaic Age. Um, as individual settlements became too large for the resources available to them, uh, they sent out colonists to go and settle some other location. All of the tags on this map that are in red uh, indicate Greek settlements. As you can see, the Greeks settled far outside of Greece proper. And really, when we're talking about the ancient Greek world, we need to mention not only the, the area now occupied by the nation of Greece, but pretty much the whole ring around the Aegean Sea here. Um, in fact, Plato later would describe the Greeks as frogs sitting around a pond. The pond, in this case, is the Aegean Sea. Uh, and so the western part of Asia Minor was all settled by, uh, by Greek-speaking peoples. Uh, this region up here called Thrace was very much settled, especially along the shoreline here. Uh, and then all along the, uh, the, the lower Adriatic Sea here, uh, Greek people settled. And, and most of southern Italy, the southern Italian peninsula, uh, was settled in the Archaic Age by Greek-speaking peoples. Uh, the eastern part of Sicily uh, was settled by Greek-speaking peoples. There were even Greeks all the way over here into southern Gaul, um, the city of Marseille, uh, the, the, uh, of, you know, French Riviera fame was originally a Greek settlement. Uh, so was Naples, by the way. The, the term Naples comes from Neapolis, or New City, uh, is, is what that means in Greek. Uh, even some settlements over here in Iberia, down here in, uh, in North Africa. Uh, the Greek word for Africa was Libya, and, and uh, the modern nation of Libya corresponds with these early Greek settlements. Uh, Cyrene uh, being particular of particular importance, that's right there. Uh, there were even some Greek settlements over here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Interestingly and importantly, there were lots and lots of Greeks who migrated up here into the Black Sea region. Why did they migrate into the Black Sea? Well, the Black Sea was um, one of the most productive agricultural regions of the ancient world, and in fact is still a very rich agricultural region today. Given that the Greeks had a scarcity of farmland, it's no surprise that they you know, immigrated up here into a region that had much better farmland. Um, and the trade in grain uh, from the Black Sea down into the Aegean was probably a long-standing thing. In fact, if we go back to the Mycenaean periods um, and can locate uh, historical circumstances for the Trojan War, now the Trojan War may be only something of legend, but uh, it's likely that wars were fought over Troy because Troy 
is right here, right where the pointer is, um, right there on this strait called the Dardanelles or the Hellespont. Um, and so someone who controlled the location of Troy uh, would be in a very good spot to control the flow of grain from the Black Sea into the Aegean and thus could profit from that trade. And so it's likely that wars were fought over, over that location, um, probably between the Hittites, who again had, you know, controlled Asia Minor back in the 15th, 14th century BCE, and Greek-speaking peoples, and so that, that probably is the historical origin of the, the famous Trojan War. Now, back to the Archaic Age. Greeks, you know, moved all over the place. Um, and these colonists, for a time, retained a uh, relationship with the metropolis, that is the mother city that sent out the colonists in the first place, but over time uh, those colonies became more and more independent and less and less reliant on, um, on the mother city. The most prolific uh, Greek cities in terms of colonization were the cities of Corinth and, uh, and Megara, uh, two cities here right along the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, together, they were responsible for, you know, quite a number of these settlements. But, but you know, most of the emerging settlements in the Archaic Age uh, eventually reached a point where they had to send out settlers to another place. Now, uh, I, I mentioned earlier on that the Greeks developed this very localized identity. And that is true. And that those identities took shape in the Archaic Age for reasons that uh, we need to discuss here in a moment. But I do want to mention the, the fact that the Greeks also retained um, a, a very strong uh, sense of, kind of overarching sense of Greek identity. People who spoke Greek related to other people who spoke Greek. They didn't particularly like, and, and there's lots of evidence for this, they didn't particularly like people who didn't speak Greek. Um, they felt a, a sense of uh, cultural uh, and linguistic superiority over non-Greek speakers. Um, in fact, the term barbarian is of Greek origin. Uh, the, the, Greek, the Greek word barbaros, uh, which means simply foreigner. Uh, but for the Greeks, uh, people who didn't speak Greek really didn't speak at all in their minds. And this is where the term barbaros comes from. It's onomatopoeic, which means it, uh, it sounds like what it's trying to describe. To the Greek ear, people who didn't speak Greek just sounded like they were saying bar, 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 um, which is where they come up with the term barbaros. Bar, the barbarians are those who don't really speak. They just go bar, bar, bar. Um, I'm not making this up. This is, this is legit. Okay. Um, uh, and so within the Greek-speaking world, there were these institutions that developed that, that people from all over the Greek world knew about, visited, relied on, uh, participated in. Let me mention two of those institutions. First, uh, down here on the north side of the Gulf of Corinth, if we go back to this other map here, uh, it's about right here. Okay. Uh, there was a settlement called Delphi. And Delphi was most known in the ancient world for having a famous temple dedicated to the god Apollo. And one of the inhabitants of that temple was a priestess who was believed to be an oracle. That is, a mouthpiece for the god. And excavations at Delphi have revealed some really interesting stuff. Uh, they show that Delphi sat right on top of uh, land that was highly active geothermically, um, or geoth I don't know if it's geothermally or geothermically, anyway. Uh, it had a lot of geothermic activity, so there were these gases that escaped from the, um, uh, from the interior of the earth, and this, uh, these gases would sort of, you know, boil up um, and escape into the temple of Apollo, and this priestess would stand in the midst of these gases and, and, uh, it looked like she was, you know, sort of being inhabited by the, uh, by the, the soul or the spirit or something of, of the god Apollo uh, as she did this. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the oracle developed a reputation for uh, being able to predict the future, 
and also for giving advice that ought to be heeded. And people came from all over the Greek world to consult with the Oracle of Delphi, because again, she was thought to speak the mind of the god Apollo. Uh, so this is a direct link to the divine. And that institution lasted for centuries, which indicates that the advice that the oracle gave probably had some validity to it. Well, how could the oracle of Delphi give good advice? There are probably several explanations for this, and if we were this were in a, in a classroom, I would stop and ask all of the students to try to come up with the reasons why the oracle gave good uh, advice. Um, uh, and you probably would say, well, people you know who are seeking information will hear what they want to hear, and if the oracle gives you know sort of ambiguous information, they will choose to interpret it however they want, and you know, if they believe strong enough, then, you know, whatever happens, it'll look like the oracle was right. And, and all of that is, is probably valid analysis, okay? The oracle does seem to have spoken in riddles, and people could interpret that however they wanted to, and, you know, uh, whatever happened, they could look back at what the oracle had said and say, well, if we interpret it that, this way, then, you know, what she said is valid. Um, and there's some cultural momentum built up with this because everybody believed in the oracle. But that, that analysis, while probably valid, does miss a really important point. And that is that Delphi itself was the information hub of the ancient Greek world. It was like the Google search of the ancient Greeks. Everybody went to Delphi. Um, people from all over the Greek, the Greek world went to Delphi to consult with the oracle. The oracle was not available at people's bidding. Uh, she was only available to give audiences a few times a year, and so people often had to wait, sometimes weeks or even months, before they could get a meeting with the oracle. What were they doing during the time they were waiting at Delphi? Well, they were talking with each other. They were probably talking to the priests of the Temple of Delphi, who were asking them what was going on in their part of the world, and through this process, the people of Delphi, the priests of the Temple of Delphi, collected information, which they likely then fed to the oracle so that she could give good predictions. So, you know, people from one city, let's uh, do a hypothetical here, say, say somebody from down here in Sparta go, uh, goes to Delphi to consult with the oracle, um, and, you know, they wonder if they should start a war with uh, one of their neighbors, with Athens, uh, to, to borrow, you know, a real historical rivalry here. And uh, while the delegation there from Sparta is waiting, the priests are asking, so what's going on down in the Peloponnesus? How are relations with Athens? Uh, what was the harvest like this year? Um, what kind of, uh, how's your alliance with these other cities doing? Um, they could, you know, produce an answer to the question of whether they should go to war um, with a, a pretty informed opinion, you know, um, and, and thus give good advice. So that's one institution that, that many Greeks, maybe most Greeks, knew about and, and uh, visited and participated in and, and uh, thought was valid. The other one, and, and the one that's probably more recognizable, uh, are the uh, religious festivals held at, at various locations that drew people from all over the Greek-speaking world. The most important of these was the Festival of Olympia. And Olympia was especially known for not only the sacrifices made to the god Zeus at Olympia, but also for the games that were celebrated in honor of Zeus. These games featured a, a number of competitions, uh, running, boxing, wrestling. Uh, the most famous of all of the events was the chariot race. That's not something you see in modern Olympics, of course. Um, uh, by the way, most of the events in the modern Olympics were not held in ancient Greece. There was no basketball or soccer or handball or water polo or judo or taekwondo or anything like that, uh, of course, in the ancient Greek Olympics. Um, there were only six or seven events, um, but these did uh, draw huge crowds. Um, and in fact, uh, cities would, you know, put a lot of money into training their best athletes so that they could win glory and honor 
at the games. Uh, victors at the Olympic Games, um, and competitors came from all over the Greek world, and, and uh, victors of the Olympic Games were not awarded gold medals, rather they were given olive uh, wreaths. Um, and, uh, and so this is just a symbolic kind of thing for them to receive the olive wreath, but their fame would be such that they probably would never have to work again. Um, they would be supported by the people of their city. These are, these are the greatest celebrities in the ancient Greek world. Um, and, uh, and so this was a, you know, the, the ancient Olympic games were a really big deal. They were held only every four years, though in the other years there were similar kinds of games held at other places, uh, one of them at Delphi, uh, one of them at Corinth, and one of them at a place called Nemea. Um, and so, uh, and then each city also had its own kind of, uh, city games. Athens was famous for, for its city games. And so athletes could compete more than every four years, um, and there were you know similar similar kinds of awards and similar kinds of fame uh, awarded to victors in these other games. So these institutions gave Greeks a common culture, even if their primary identity was local. All right. Now let's turn at this point to this local identity. If you have questions about uh, any of the things I've talked about up to this point, please ask them on the discussion board. Um, uh, there may be there may be a number of questions that arise from the things that I've said, so please feel free to bring them up on the discussion board. In the Archaic Age, Greek cities were constantly at war with each other. Why were they at war? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, land was scarce. And so fighting with one's neighbor to procure even a few more acres of farmland could mean the difference between the people of the city nearly starving to death and the people of the city thriving with the crops that they were able to produce. Most of these um, cities were really just small towns, and it was worth it to them to go to battle with their neighbors to fight for just small parcels of land because again people in the Greek world kind of lived on the margins from time to time if they didn't have enough land you know I mean there wasn't enough food to go around and, and uh, they reached a crisis point and so they were constantly at war with each other now we should not envision these wars as huge wars between, you know, involving lots and lots of different poles fighting uh, all over the Greek world. Rather, these were just small skirmishes between individual city-states. Um, the battle formation the Greeks fought in was called the hoplite phalanx. And this is a tremendously influential institution. You might think this is just a battle formation, but it did have tremendous social effects. Uh, as you can see from this illustration on a piece of red figure pottery um, from late in the Archaic Age, the hoplite phalanx was made up of warriors who formed themselves into these tightly packed phalanx formations. The key piece of equipment is this huge shield. In fact, that's called the hoplon. And so hoplites were the warriors who carried hoplons. Uh, the warriors, you know, wielding these hoplons uh, would stand shoulder to shoulder with the shield attached to the left arm uh, of each warrior. And that shield was large enough that it would cover not only the person uh, who was holding it, but also kind of the right side of the warrior standing right next to them. Um, and so they, you know, they bunch up together in these tightly packed formations, and uh, they, they did have armor. You can see they have leg greaves and helmets and breastplates and things like this. But by far the most important piece of equipment was the shield. Now, the, offensively, they did. They had a spear, and these spears would poke out between the gaps in the shields, or maybe over the shields. And the people in this tight phalanx formation would march together in unison onto the battlefield and meet up with the hoplite phalanx of the rival city. Um, and uh, you know, we need to try to envision how these battles took place. Pretty much, the phalanxes would march 
and crash into each other. And then it became sort of a reverse tug of war. The people, um, the warriors who were armed behind, would push with their shields on the on the people in the front line, uh, and then the next line would push against the second line, and so forth and so on, all the way across, uh, all the way through the formation, uh, until one side broke, and the phalanx would probably trample a few people, uh, would break through. Uh, the phalanx that was defeated would uh, be thrown into disarray, and they would try to probably try to run back to a, a, another spot on the battlefield and form up a phalanx again and try to uh, to hold some kind of line there. Uh, but for the most part, these battles are while um, there were a few you know a few moments at least of uh, maybe a few minutes of of, of intense fighting were probably over rather quickly. It was just, you know, whichever side broke first would lose the battle, and they would then, then you know, uh, lay, you know, the victorious side would lay claim to some of the farmland of the defeated side, and, and that was pretty much it. Battles took place in the summer, because the people who fought were not professional soldiers. They were farmers. They were members of the community, who put their lives on hold for a couple of weeks every year in the summer to go and fight. It was part of the calendar, as it were. Um, and they knew that it was worth it because, again, if you get a few more acres of farmlands, then the city is, you know, everybody in the city is better off. Now, this has tremendous social effects. Um, first of all, uh, because the people in the phalanx, well, let me back up for a second. There are two things that would give one hoplite phalanx advantage over another hoplite phalanx. And the first of these is simply the number of people who could be fielded to fight in the phalanx. Who could be recruited, I should say, to fight in the phalanx. Um, now, the leaders of these emerging Greek city-states, and I'm going to use from this point on the Greek term for that, which is polis, P-O-L-I-S. Um, the next slide talks about the polis, so I will, I will you know, say a lot more about this. But anyway, these individual polis that uh, developed in the Archaic Age were ruled by a basileus, almost universally, ubiquitously, all through the Greek world, um, each one had its own military chieftain. Uh, and the Basileus was almost certainly the largest landholder in the polis. Uh, had far more property than any of the other landholders. The Basileus was probably surrounded by a group of companions who formed a kind of aristocracy. And they together, the Basileus and, the, and his companions, would dominate uh, the politics of the polis. Okay? But the Basileus and his closest companions were insufficient in numbers to produce an effective hoplite phalanx. And so they had to recruit from among the other landholders. And this is a key point, because... We have to consider what would motivate a person who has only a few acres of land, maybe lives, you know, a basic kind of subsistence farming life. If they have a bad harvest, they're likely to, to starve to death or at least become extremely weak. <coughs> what would motivate a person living in that kind of situation to fight in a hoplite phalanx alongside the Basileus, who has exponentially more property. What could the Basileus and his companion aristocrats offer to a small family farmer to get the small family farmer to risk his life in support of these wars? Well, here again, I would ask the students questions. Uh, this, this question in a classroom. And the responses are usually land. Well, that's a decent answer, but remember, land is very scarce in the Greek world, so probably not land. Another answer would be money. Well, many of these uh, city-states or the polis in the ancient, uh, uh, the archaic period at least, um, they may have had some early forms of coinage. 
Uh, but money was not necessarily how people did their, their business with each other. Okay, So probably not land or money. What could motivate a person, a small family farmer, to risk his life fighting in the hoplite phalanx? The answer is a political position. Okay, Political power. A say in the governing of the police. In other words, the Basileus was willing to sacrifice some of his political power to get more and more people to join with him in fighting. And so the hoplite phalanx ended up being uh, an important agent of social change. People who fought in the phalanx, the landholders that is, developed a sense of identity with their community. They were committed to the community committed enough to go risk their lives every year fighting uh, to try to procure more land. Um, it's from that context that the Greeks began to develop this concept of citizenship. That is, people who belong to the polis. People who have a say in the government. Um, it was it was fighting in the hoplite phalanx that, that gave that to them, right? Now the hoplite phalanx did have a cultural impact as well, um, because they uh, were required to fight periodically in the hoplite phalanx. Greeks were incentivized, we might even say required, to be in shape, to train as warriors. Um, to be in shape enough, at the very least, to carry a 50-pound shield and maybe, you know, 20 or 30 pounds more of, uh, of spear and sword and, and uh, armor and things like that into battle, um, they had to spend some time working out. And so the Greeks developed uh, the concept of fitness as a cultural imperative. People had to be fit because they had to fight. And so, you know, we see lots of depictions in art, uh, descriptions in literature of Greeks exercising. Um, and that became a very important part of the, of the culture of each polis. And, and they developed institutions that would give them uh, the ability, um, the, the facilities necessary to do their exercising, right? Um, and so every, you know, every city uh, had its own kind of workout facility. Um, its own stadium where they would hold competitions and things like that, uh, and they encouraged, uh, we might even say required, the citizens to participate in these kinds of activities so they could be ready to fight in the phalanx when the time came to do so. All right, Here, here's another depiction, by the way, of the hoplite phalanx. This is a later development um, in the Hellenistic period. Uh, the size of the shield was shrunk quite a bit, and, and the spear became longer and longer. This is the kind of formation that the army of Alexander the Great used in fighting his wars of conquest. So we'll, we'll come back to that later. Now, the most important product of this development in the Archaic period was this institution called the polis. We translate that as city-state. Almost all settlements in the Greek-speaking world formed these polis. Um, there are a few characteristics of the polis that we should talk about. Uh, first of all, most of them are quite small. Uh, maybe only a few hundred or at most a few thousand inhabitants, but very tight-knit with the concept of citizenship and, and a high degree of citizen involvement, not only in the hoplite phalanx, but in the political affairs of the city. Um, this is both a political and a cultural unit. Uh, so people who belong to a particular police uh, were um, purveyors or participants in the culture of that police. Each police had its own patron god or goddess, uh, its own institutions that were unique to the police, um, and, uh, you know, its own culture, its own styles of clothing, its own literature, its own um, uh, forms of art, um, and, and things like that. Um, 
Now, what's interesting about this is that at the same time, these Greeks are participating in the overarching Pan-Hellenic culture, things like the Oracle of Delphi and the, and the, uh, the Pan-Hellenic games, like the Olympic games and, and things like this. And so they, you know, they had these shared conceptions with other Greeks, but each police developed its own particular spin on the larger culture. And so just to give you an example, uh, the polis of Athens and the polis of Sparta both worshipped the same patron deity, that is, the goddess Athena. But the cult of Athena in Athens um, differed dramatically from the cult of Athena in Sparta. Um, Athena was the goddess of both war, particularly strategy and warfare, but of war and of wisdom. And it seems the Spartans worshipped Athena primarily because she, uh, because of her association with war. The Spartans were the most militaristic of all of the Greek poles, um, and so Athena meant a lot to them because she was the goddess of war and strategy. The Athenians, on the other hand, were particularly interested in wisdom, and, and uh, the, the cult of Athena in wisdom seems to have, while it, it probably celebrated her as the warrior goddess, also um, had a lot to do with, uh, with her capacity for wisdom and her governance over wisdom. Uh, and so, you know, these patron deities, although they're the same deity, uh, the, the shape that the worship of that deity took was very different in Athens than it was in Sparta. Uh, finally, um, women in the police had very little role, in most of them at least. And so women were relegated to a secondary position. Um, they had pretty much no public role, uh, no say in the, in the governing. Their activities were confined in most poles to the private sphere. Uh, they ruled over the household. Uh, the primary job of a woman in ancient Athens, for instance, was to take care of the households, um, uh, to govern its affairs, because the men were the ones involved in the governments. And, and, uh, the properly ordered society was one where both men and women knew their place. Women uh, managed the household, and men managed the affairs of the city itself. Um, that's not to say that you know that's the, uh, the the way things should be done. This offends the sensibilities of people in the modern age, I think. But um, it's important for us to understand why they did the things they did to understand their context. Now, over the course of the Archaic Age and into the Classical Age, these Greek poles experimented with every type of government, pretty much, that has been attempted in Western civilization. Most of them, pretty much all of them, started out as a monarchy, that is, as a territory ruled by a warrior chieftain called a Basileus. Uh, the Basileus had, as we talked about, his military companions who formed an aristocracy, and together they controlled the largest share of the land and most of the political power in uh, the newly emerging polis. Uh, however, the uh, dominant position of the Basileus and the aristocracy was eroded over time, partly due to the requirements of the hoplite phalanx, partly due to the fact that the Basileus ceded more and more power to people who were willing to fight, uh, but even still, um, the pace of change was often too slow for the people. And so the Greek polis uh, witnessed in the Archaic Age a number of revolutions. Um, each polis, pretty much, there are a few exceptions, went through a period the Greeks called tyranny. Now we have to be careful here. The word tyrant in ancient Greek had a different meaning, at least initially, than it does today. Today, tyrant indicates something like dictator. Often there are connotations of brutality or cruelty associated with the word tyrant. Um, when we think of tyrants, we think of Adolf Hitler or, or, or somebody like that. Um, but the word tyrant originally did not have that kind of negative meaning. A tyrant was rather a champion of the people, of the interests of the people. Um, in most poles, around the maybe the late 7th or early 6th, 6th century BCE, uh, the people, the, 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 the citizens, the, the common landholders, not the aristocrats of the Basileus, 
demanded change and somebody from the aristocracy was willing to set himself up as their champion and to occupy the position of tyrant. In Athens, for instance, there was a guy named Pisistratus who um, uh, kind of seized power in Athens with the support of the people in the middle of the 6th century, brought about a number of reforms, left Athens in a, in a changed political state. Uh, the problem with these tyrants, although they initially they were agents of, of needed reform, now the problem with the tyrants is that they had a difficult time letting go of power. In most cases, the tyrants tried to pass along power to somebody else in their family, usually their sons, in other words, they're trying to reinstitute a kind of monarchy. And in most cases, the tyrants were then overthrown by the people who brought about even more reforms and did away with anything that smacked of monarchy or aristocracy. Um, and so that's how tyrants got the bad name, or rather the word came to have the pejorative connotations that it has. Um, uh, because these tyrants were, you know, while welcome initially, uh, took on too much power and the people overthrew them. Uh, and set up a different kind of government. In most places, uh, by the classical age, by about the fifth century or so, uh, poles were ruled by an oligarchy. That is, and that word means rule by a few. Okay. Uh, the difference between oligarchy in the in the Greek sense, at least, and aristocracy is that um, the power of the oligarchs was not necessarily tied to land and wealth. In most poles, there were a group of magistrates chosen by some sort of voting body made up of all of the citizens. Um, and in most places, citizens meant landholders. Okay. Um, the only exception, of course, is Athens, which we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, there was some sort of voting body, and they would choose the magistrates who were in charge of the affairs of the city. Uh, there was more than just one magistrate. In most places, there were, were multiple magistrates, and they each had different tasks. One magistrate, for instance, would be over the uh, financial affairs of the city. Another magistrate would be over the military uh, of the city. Um, Apologies for the uh, noise in the background. I'm I'm uh, filming this in my office, and they're doing some construction on Keenan Hall, and so we get this background noise here. Uh, in any case, um, back to back to oligarchy. Okay, and so the citizen body would choose these magistrates. These magistrates would have different uh, responsibilities. There were magistrates over, as I said, the financial affairs, the military affairs. Uh, there were even magistrates in, in almost all poles who had the religious responsibilities. That is, they saw to the worship of the city cult, the worship of the patron deity. Um, there was no separate clergy in ancient Greece. There was no real separation between church and state. Religion was the function of government magistrates. Um, and so there were checks and balances on power. One person did not have all of the power, in other words. Um, the oligarchs each had their own separate res uh, responsibility that was separate from that of the other magistrates. Okay, So that's how these oligarchies functioned in ancient Greece. Um, and, and again, most places were ruled by oligarchs. Uh, there were also limitations put on uh, the terms of office. And so oligarchs were chosen for limited time, uh, their their powers were limited, and uh, and and thus you know this this kept any one individual from gaining uh, too much power. Now the other form of government that we should mention here is democracy. Athens became democratic, and how that happened and the way that happens uh, is uh, a subject for. Uh, for, for the next lecture. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, we have now you know, gone through the Archaic Age and we'll dive uh, next lecture into the classical period of Greek history.